This is a team effort, and it gives me great pleasure to begin our evening by introducing an incredible player on our collective team. Clifton Leaf, an assistant managing editor at Fortune Magazine, is the author of Truth in Small Doses, Why We're Losing the War on Cancer and How to Win It, published by Simon & Schuster last summer. Until recently, he was a guest editor for the New York Times op-ed page and Sunday Review. Before that, he was an executive editor at Fortune, where he also wrote a number of prominent feature articles. It was after one such writing assignment, a 2004 Fortune cover story entitled Why We're Losing the War on Cancer and How to Win It, that Cliff began working to change the way that global cancer fight is funded and pursued. A keynote or featured speaker at more than three dozen scientific conferences around the world, Cliff has presented testimony to the President's <coughs> Cancer Panel three times, given a plenary address at the annual meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research, and delivered grand rounds at the National Cancer Institute. A recipient of the Henry R. Luce Award for Public Service, the NIHCM's Healthcare Journalism Award, and several leadership awards for patient organizations, Cliff has been a moderator or panelist in numerous cancer-related meetings, including three Capitol Hill briefings for members of Congress. For three years, he's also served on the National Board of Directors for Susan G. Komen for the Cure, the world's largest breast cancer charity. Please join me in welcoming Clifton Leaf. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much. I, I really, I know that people always say this, you know, that what an honor and privilege it is to be here, but I was thinking actually today what an honor it is to be here uh, among you. I, last year I actually lost a friend to a brain tumor and um, she was a really remarkable woman. I went to high school with her, we were friends for a long time. And, um, you know, I was thinking about the care uh, and passion that her family and friends gave to her along the way. And the loss is so resounding and so continuing, uh, but it's also mixed with a lot of celebration about her life. And it's, a, it's, it's sort of a privilege to think about her um, as, I, as I continue to mourn her. And I imagine you all, many of you feel the same way. Um, tonight, I want to talk, I want to take you back. I want to go retro on you and take you back half a century and half a world away. Uh, to a story that I think is one of the most remarkable in cancer research. And um, I want to use that to, to uh, get a sense of what we can learn from that. I'm going to start this timer because I'm going to do something remarkable. I'm going to go through 82 slides in 30 minutes. So uh, you guys can see if I, if, I, if I keep this up. So the year was 1957, and Dennis Burkett had been in... Uh, Uganda for 10 years at that point, most of that time in Kampala, which was the rolling old city of the Uganda kingdom and then had become the, the, the capital of the British colony there. He was the chief surgeon of one of the three Malago hospitals uh, surgical wards, but he was not a great surgeon. He was a kind of a bush surgeon in his own words. There would be more time for artistry if there weren't so many patients. Parents were bringing in their kids with their bones wilted from hunger and, and, and bent from polio and ulcerated from infection and, and gouged with animal bites. And there was no shortage of plagues everywhere. There was, of course, malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, but there was also kwashiorkor and, and, and onion fever and yaws, which was too terrible to think about, and, and hydrocell, very bizarre ailments that would happen to, to, to children and, and young adults. Uh, and this, the pace would have been grueling enough for anybody. You know, a, a young doctor right out of, fresh out of medical school. But this, Burkett was 46 at this point. He had three young children. And his wife, seen here in Olive, was in and out of bad health. Plus there was another, I guess you could call it a, a handicap for a, you know, an occupational handicap for a surgeon. He was missing an eye. So it had been actually hard to convince the British Medical Research Service that, he should, that they should allow a one-eyed surgeon um, to come and work in their midst. Um, obviously, they were worried about depth perception, and that was a real issue. But, but somehow, 
even with his loss of an eye, he was able to see things that others missed. That was one of the most remarkable things about Dennis Burkett. And this is a picture of the Milagro Hospital. <laughs> he, he had lost his eye as a boy. He had gotten, in Northern Ireland, he'd been at prep school, and uh, he'd gotten caught in the warring factions uh, between two groups of boys. And, um, and somebody threw a rock and it hit him in the, in the eyeglasses and it, the glass shards went into his eye and he ended up having a glass ball instead. Um, but of all the things that he'd seen, nothing could have possibly prepared him for this. Now, his name was Africa. He was five years old and he was terrified. And you can see here, he, he had two, four equally spaced tumors in his jaw. Two, one in the mandible on the left, uh, on the, uh, the upper jaw, rather, uh, on the left, and one on the, uh, on the upper jaw on the right that seemed, seemed equally spaced and equally uh, parallel. And then one in the, two in the lower jaw as well, as if, as if a, a forest fire had crossed over a firewall. And it was just he had never seen anything like this. Shortly after it, he took the boy, um, he took some photographs, and new surgery was impossible, and, and the boy died. Uh, and then a few weeks later, he was, he was doing rounds in Jinja, uh, a, a district about 50 miles away, which is based on Lake Victoria. Some said the, the, the Nile River began here. And he took his one good eye, and he looked out the open window, and he saw another boy, unbelievably, with the same face swollen as if, as if a balloon had stretched out of his face. So he ran over there, talked to the boy's mother, and convinced her to get into their truck and take them back to the Milago Hospital. Birkin examined the, the boy, um, and then he took photographs as he always did. He used, to, he used to develop these photographs in his bathtub, and his little girls would come in to see what daddy was cooking. And here, most of the time they were very frightened, but this time they weren't, because it didn't look real. It just it looked like it was something was wrong with the photographs. Well, Birkin, of course, was incredibly distressed. I mean, it was just, how, how was he missing? Was this some new ailment, new, a frightening new infection? Well, he started to see these children everywhere and see them in records of the hospitals. And he was very good about checking the records. And it turns out there were quite a few of these. And I'll try not to stay too long on this slide since you're eating dinner. But um, the, the point was that many people had missed them because they were categorizing them in the wrong way. If it, was, if it had come in a pathologist was sort of marking them well, whether it had come from an eye or it seemed to be the primary tumor source was an eye, they called it a retinoblastoma, or the bone and osteosarcoma, and so on. And they were missing the, a connection between these tumors, many of which would also manifest in the jaw. And everywhere Burkitt went, in his rounds, he would say to everybody, have you seen this tumor? And he had a wonderful Irish lilt, very, very charming guy, and he would engage people left and right, have you seen this tumor? Well, it seemed at the time, after only a few weeks, that this was the most common tumor in children in Africa. That's how many sources he got uh, that, that it were able to sort of bear this out. And he sent a little publication, gave out some rounds to some uh, local East African surgeons, and then he published a paper on it, and he got absolutely no reaction. Absolutely none whatsoever. Until George Etley, a hot shot oncologist from South Africa, came into, into the, the round, into the Milano Hospital, and uh, as usual, Burkitt came to him and said, you know, have you seen this tumor? And Etley says, this tumor does not occurred in South Africa. That's my best South African accent. <laughs> my daughter says they all sound Irish, but uh, anyway. So if the cancer was common in Uganda, but didn't exist at all in South Africa, South Africa, then where between these two lands did it stop? Where was the edge? So Burkett did something. He decided to ask the, two, the question that he'd been asking. He decided to mass market it. And he created a flyer three pictures of children, and he printed up 1,200 of them, and he got a list of every hospital admission, admission um, center in, uh, in Africa, and he sent them all out. And he applied for his first ever research grant, and he received 15 pounds, which was then about $40. <laughs> so, uh, so he sent them out, and over the course of uh, three, four years, I think three years, 
he got 400 responses. And you can see these push pins here. And what he did is he color coded the push pins. So it was like one, a sporadic case of uh, this, little, this strange, by now they knew it was a lymphoma. Uh, they would put one color. And then if there were clusters, there'd be another color. And he actually had three different maps. One of all of Africa, the, content, the whole continent, one of East Africa, and one of Uganda. And he was so, um, his family called him cheap, but he was so parsimonious, he was so uh, good with money that, that he, um, that he hand painted each of these, rather than spend the 11 cents or so on the mapping pins, he hand painted each one. And he was famous for this sort of thing. But three years and 400 responses, even though a pattern was emerging, you can see there was a little belt that was happening. It would come from, I've got a little uh, pointer here, but from say Senegal here on the Atlantic coast and through Cameroon and then Uganda and all the way to Kenya over here on the right, and then down here, but it would sort of snake through down here on, on, the, on the Indian Ocean side from uh, Uganda to Malawi, t t Tanzania, which was then Tanganyika, and then and so forth, all the way down here, but it would stop. So there were there was nothing in Southwest Africa, for example. And you know, epidemiology is hard to do in itself, but it's really hard to do by postal carrier. It's incredibly slow. So he decided that he would try to do something that he started calling a geographical biopsy. And uh, so he uh, and uh, these two fellows here, this oh I did that thing I'm not supposed to do here. So this guy here on the left is Cliff Nelson. He was a Canadian missionary. And this guy is Ted Williams. Ted had an amazing skill for a doctor. Uh, he could change the front end bearing on a car in the time it would take to, to have a cup of coffee. He was a phenomenal mechanic. And so uh, uh, Dennis begged and begged and begged his friends to come on this journey with him through Africa to do a, 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 essentially a tumor safari, as he called it, a geographical biopsy of Africa. And, um, and they said no, no, and then of course Perkins said yes, yes, and then of course eventually they did. And, and I want to show you this next slide because this is what they took here on the, on the, on the um, you can see this whole path here. They went through, it took 10 weeks, 12 countries, 56 hospitals and mission statements, 10,000 miles they went through. Each time Burkitt would write ahead so that he made sure they get enough time talking with administrators and nurses and doctors. And it was amazing what they learned along the way. At one point, one of the pathologists at a local hospital in Lorenzo Mar, near the Indian Ocean, had partnered with a museum curator to make plaster casts of these poor children. And they put them in crates and forgot about them in the basement. And somebody mentioned, oh yeah, we got those downstairs. And Burkitt, who was by then 50 years old, dutifully carried them all up to the roof and photographed each of them. On their way, the roads would sometimes wash out. They would have these torrential rains. Um, and then sometimes it was even worse, where it wouldn't be rainy, it would be so hot and dusty, where they had to make a choice whether to open the windows or not. If they, if they opened the windows, they would choke to death on dust. If they closed the windows, they would bake to death. And this is how they would go on hour after hour after hour, singing Bible hymns and telling stories. And most of the time, talking about this strange, mysterious tumor. And Burkitt afterwards said, you know, it's that unheard discussion of being in a car that made us think in ways that we never would have. If we were just sitting there writing papers in our labs, we wouldn't have had the kind of engagement that would have us think differently about this problem. And he said one of the key issues was when somebody said, well, what if it's not a geographical pattern, but a topographical one? What if it had more to do with altitude and rainfall and, 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 and something else rather than just simply where they were? So this changed the whole equation here. And you can see that the cases that they had discovered on his little pushpin map were where it was very warm and very wet. You know, a certain distance from the equator, it, it mattered how high what the altitude was of the town where the children, where the children were infected. And when he mentioned this to yet another person, he would ask researchers everywhere. And one, at one point, he, asked, he showed this to an entomologist. And he said, oh, this looks just like an outbreak we had of sleeping sickness a year ago. And that was caused by the tsetse fly. So he mentioned that to a pathologist named Jack Davies. And uh, Jack was a very smart guy. He says, no, 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 I think it's the Anopheles, Anopheles mosquito. 
And this is where the payload of the Anopheles mosquito is throughout sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's malaria. And look at the pattern here between where the malaria belt was and Burkitt's lymphoma. Now this was just one pattern. When it happened, there was also a link between that. Now, any of you pathologists out there can tell me, virologists out there can tell me what that is. Epstein-Barr virus. So, at one point, years before the, the, the tumor safari, when, when Burkitt was already, by then he was already getting to be known, but he used to take these, these trips to London and, and um, give these speeches about crazy African diseases that he would encounter. And no one showed up to these things, except this one guy, Martin Epstein. And Martin Epstein was listening to this tale of Burkitt's lymphoma and thinking, wow, this is the first, there are a lot of indications that this might be a virally induced cancer. And there was a lot of excitement about this. This has never been shown in a human being before. There had been relationships, of course, between viruses and animal cancers. There was the Rousseau virus, which was famous, and there was a Lucase frog virus, and, uh, and, and all sorts of others, but in cottontail rabbits, but never in human beings. And so, Ber so Epstein went afterwards and he invited Burkitt to tea, and, and he said to Burkitt, uh, would you mind if you just sent me a few tumor samples along the way? Now this is 1960, 60 or so. It's very hard to send tumor samples. You can even imagine what it must have been like. But Burkitt dutifully said yes. And once a week, he would pack them in dry ice and wet ice as well and to the one flight at the Kampala airport that would go to London the next day. And then Tony Epstein would race to get it, and unpack them, and most of the time they were like destroying the samples. It was just too difficult to do. Every once in a while, though, the samples would, would emerge pristine, and we would put it under one of the rare electron microscopes they have. And time after time, he was looking for something, something, something. And eventually, on I think the 38th try, he found a virus, which became known as Epstein-Barr's virus, in the nuclei of these tumor cells of Burkitt's lymphoma. And the team got bigger and bigger. This guy over there, if you can recognize his face, that's C. Everett Koop, who convinced Werner and Gertrude Henley two virologists to look into this and work on this EBV connection. And they, of course, published a lot uh, about this EBV. And for the first time, Burkitt cell line after Burkitt cell line, there was this EBV positive in these nuclei. So a theory was emerging, remarkably. You know, um, a theory was connecting malaria, which was endemic, um, with EBV, which was by then thought to be a new universal virus, about 90% of human beings almost everywhere have this done, was somehow connecting, transforming a B lymphocyte and, and, and creating this cancer. And how? No one knew. But the fact that all this was happening so quickly was really remarkable, except that wasn't where it stopped. In fact, Joe Bergenau, who was working with chemotherapy, chemotherapy engagements in, at the Sloan Kettering Institute in, in New York, had come over to stop in, in Kampala and visited. He was very excited. Now people were coming to pay, pay visits to, uh, to Burkitt. And Burkitt cornered and was very excited about the work that, that Birkenau and others were doing with uh, childhood leukemias and other, uh, other cancers. Um, and uh, much of that work discovered and done here by Sidney Farber in Boston. But he was talking about methotrexate and cyclophosphamide. And, and of course, Burkitt, all he could say is, oh, we're going to get some of that stuff. And so every time manufacturers would come in, he would, he would corner them and the virus will somehow get some of these, these new agents. And um, the trials that they did could hardly be called trials. They were sort of like shotgun and single arm deals. And um, they tried and they gave it to a boy, uh, the methotrexate the first, and, uh, and uh, this isn't this guy, but they gave it to somebody else and unfortunately he died. They were dying within days. They had to do something, I mean, weeks. For the most at the at the out at the outset, um, and then at one point he gave, I believe it was a combination of cyclophosphamide and something else to this child, and lo and behold, uh, a short-term remission. Well, Birkin again was working on the clinical research side with lots of others too, constantly collaborating, and he worked with this guy named Peter Clifford in Nairobi. and he's standing there with two boys who were cured of, of, of Birkin's lymphoma, and um, here, this is a picture of him with 15 children cured of, of Burkitt's using uh, many of these early chemotherapy agents. So I raced through the story, and so far I'm on time, and I want to tell you why. 
Nine years. Nine years. The who, the what, the where, and the when of a heretofore undiscovered cancer syndrome or unnoticed cancer syndrome had been answered. And a phenomenal, unbelievable progress that was happening. Just nothing like it had ever happened. Nine years, all of this happened. And all that really remained were the how and the why. Over the next 16 years, some more clues to the how. And these were very, very critical because you can see here, and many of you who, who study the genetic basis of cancer, this was one of the first oncogenes discovered, CMIC, um, discovered um, uh, by Carlo Croce's group and others um, at the, at around the same time. And this was, people were beginning to talk about this as the Rosetta Stone of cancer. That this, here was this fast moving lymphoma that was caused by a translocation um, that had created, here's the translocation right here. Um, you can see a little bit of one chromosome goes off on the, on the bottom of the other um, and creates a monster gene um, called an oncogene, um, and in this case known as MYC. And, um, and this was what was starting this cancer. People were really excited back then. This was the early 80s. People were like, wow, we really got something that is, is pointing us in the right direction. So then the next 32 years happened. And I don't want to minimize any of the, the progress that was made during that time, but I will say that in Burkitt's lymphoma, only, it's only a little better understood than it was then. It's still common in children. There's absolutely no prevention of it. There are theories about lots of things about what might be uh, instigating these, these, these children. There, there's, there are patterns, the, the odd patterns of age and gender, but nobody really has been able to do anything about it. The cost of treatment, even though most of these drugs, in fact, virtually all of them are off patent, um, is prohibitively expensive. It's about $2,800 in the average cost. These are old numbers. It's the best I could get. But it's three times the family income at the time. Uh, and so we have essentially uh, status quo. I mean, not much has changed. Uh, and so my question to you all is, what changed between then and now? And this is really where I'm excited to, to be here because I know that the, 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 the um, National Brain Tumor uh, Society has really thought about those kinds of issues. What are the systemic reasons? Why, you know, it's not that we are making progress, we are, but, but why, what, what's, 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 making, what's preventing us from working faster? And so to answer that, we might try to imagine how someone like Dennis Burkett a young dentist would fare in today's cancer research culture. And to do that, I think we got to give him a good haircut. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now we have Burkitt, we need Dennis Burkitt in 2014. Really, the whole speech, this is the only thing that goes on. It's all for this. Now, now, all he needs, all this guy needs is a research grant. Right? So all he needs is a research grant now. Now, that's all. You know? um, and really that means he needs an ROI. So now you go back here. Oops, wait a minute. Um, so the average age for a first time ROI in 1980, about when this sort of period of change happened, was about 36. A uh, significant share of, of research project grants uh, were, were back then from 1980 were, were uh, to young investigators, somebody like Somebody like a young dentist, even Dennis would have been too old for this, but, but um, the share of principal investigators, again, pretty remarkable. And you can see a very, very big change that's happened between now and then. Now, but long shot or not, he's got to try, okay? So, so, and try hard, and that means he has to quickly rack up some publications. And in today's cancer realm, that means he has to find his own little corner of the map. And when I say map, I mean something like this. Now this is a famous, every young researcher has this sign on their life. In their labs, they've printed up this poster. And this is the famous subway map of cancer pathways by Weinberg. And, and, um, and really, in this case, you just can't do the whole map. You really have to find your little corner. So here's Mick here. And we can see this is the mysterious oncogene at the heart of, of, uh, of many endemic Burkitt's lymphoma cases. Um, and the only problem is that the field here is rather crowded, right? So he may want to study this as much as he wants, or a young dentist. Um, but in fact, um, there are already 
are 27,948 published papers on MIT as of this morning. <laughs> so um, just to give you some perspective on, in Google Scholar, it's also, uh, I don't know if you can see that number, 578,000 results on Google Scholar. Um, and just to give you some perspective about that, here is the other Nick. Uh, <laughs> this is only about 15,000 hits on Google Scholar. <laughs> so you can judge that. Does that make sense to you? Not, not to right. But here are the original papers. Well, I, can't, I don't know where the papers went, but they were here. Um, and the amazing thing is that we still haven't been able to translate all that acquired knowledge to better treatments or preventive measures, certainly for Birkins, or, or really, in the case of Nick, anything. You know. Now, there are some signaling cascades, or some molecules that have, and the, 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 the study of which, the knowledge gained from which, have yielded some remarkable treatments. And so, a remarkable, um, you know, BCR able is, is the classic example, which has given us lead back in the case of chronic myeloid leukemia and some other diseases. Um, and what we're seeing now in immunotherapy, for example, is studying CTLA-4 and PD-1. So I'm not going to sort of you know, paint everything with a broad brush, but let's just take these five, these other four, and add Nick to that, and you get five. This is what we've seen in terms of the crowded fields. Because a lot of these young researchers who are studying these particular signaling molecules um, are, uh, are, are sort of in, in tough straits if they want to try to make a name for themselves in this, but they've got to do it. So, so and to give you a sense of, um, of the speed at which we are producing this, this is what we produced in just the last year, okay? So I, can, uh, some, I think we're missing some numbers here, but that's 20,983 published papers on just these five okay, signaling uh, cascades in just the past year, so October 2nd to October 1st uh, in one year. Now that's, that's really remarkable. Um, the, it's expensive, certainly. Um, Sir David Lane, one of the pioneers in P53, um, had estimated in 2005, when there were 38,000 papers, um, that each of these papers required about $100,000 of resources, whether that's institutional resources or brain, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, charitable group resources or academic, institutional, or, or government, <coughs> but it's $100,000 or so. Now, it, it's, uh, so when he said that, um, he also said this, yet we have a surprisingly incomplete understanding of P53. This is the famous tumor suppressor that's in, involved in about half of all cancers. Um, we have no really effective P53 based, based uh, therapies or diagnostic tools, although there is something in China. And, um, and that really is a remarkable. If you use his, his numbers there, I don't know why this is getting cut off here, but, um, but it doesn't matter, you get the point, is $7.3 billion spent on P53, $6.6 .6 billion on TGF beta, another five or so billion on ROS, BCL, and so forth. Now, Ron Pino, uh, the head of MD Anderson, was in my office uh, on Thursday, on Friday, and I read these numbers by him, and he said, he laughed. He said, $100,000, was more like $200,000, $300,000 per, per published paper, um, which I thought was interesting. I mean, he has he's seen it from all sides. He was a longtime uh, researcher at Dana Farber before going to run Dana Farber. But it's more than that. I don't want you to think this is just about money. No, the real cost is what happens, happens to our young scientists, OK? So, because Dennis, circa 2014, here's his face, needs not just one paper, but many. Not just one, any journal, but a top tier journal. Not just any kind of place in the long byline, but first author. He needs to get any edge he can so he can get through this, okay? This is the R01 review process. And I'm not gonna ask you to read any of this stuff, but I will point you to this number down here, which says 9%. That's the pay line in 2014 for the NCI. And what that means is, forget all this, nine out of 10 of them are gonna fail, okay? They're just not gonna get their R01. So they've gone through this whole process and they're not gonna get it, okay? Now, the whole process takes a year to complete, okay? And they have little choice if you're a young researcher, again, we're talking about young Dennis Burkett here, he's gonna have to do it all again or be out of a job. So what happens, okay? Well, this is what happens, okay? Squeeze bucket. So 
If the work you propose isn't virtually certain of success, it won't get funded. You know, this is Roger Kornberg, uh, Nobel laureate. If you propose something totally new without any preliminary data, you're laughed out of your study section, or euphemistically called triage. And here's a great quote from Tom Cech, another Nobel laureate. I mean, about really, and this one blue ribbon panel after another has been noticing this, has been, has been commenting on this problem. It's a fundamental problem, is that we're shying away from the real good stuff. You know, we're afraid to take the leaps of faith. And so what happens is our young <laughs> research gets more and more frustrated. So what about collaboration and sharing all that stuff I talked about, Dennis Burke and the excitement of, of bringing everybody into it? Well, there's little incentive for that in our system. You know, and so here's what you have, and this is just a smattering of, 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 of headlines I grabbed. I actually was cleaning out some files because after 10 years after of writing a cancer book, my wife finally said, you've got to get those file cabinets out of my house. <laughs> and so I had been purging, and I just and all I kept finding was like data sharing and this and that. And it was so hard to throw that stuff out. But what happens is what you're turning people who would be inclined, academics, scientists who who would love to be able to collaborate and reach across, you're turning them very competitive uh, to the point where they really don't want to participate in, in that kind of shared environment. And so my question to you is, have we unlearned the lessons of the long safari? And have we created a system that encourages scientists to compete rather than collaborate, to hoard data rather than share it? to focus on the safe and narrow rather than on the risky and expansive and potentially paradigm shifting. Not all the time, but a lot. And if so, then what can we do about it? And so here's in the last two minutes that I have. I just want to talk about what we need is, again, this is missing, but that says cultural makeover, the missing words there, which maybe there's something magical about the fact that those words are missing. Uh, <laughs> We have to stop talking about sharing data and specimens, and we have to turn that into genuine sharing. We have to stop this whole cycle of grantsmanship fight, and, and start and moving towards true collaboration. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by you stop funding projects and you start funding people. Now, that seems like a bumper sticker. It's sloganeering, I know. I hate stuff like that. I'm an editor of a magazine, when a young reporter comes in with something like that, I, I have to like hold my nose. But, but fundamentally, this is what this is about. And John Iannidis, who's a researcher at Stanford, has talked about several ways in which we might do that. And you think about how crazy that sounds, at least in the academic community, but that's what every business in the world works like. We fund people, not projects. And my magazine, you know, we know we get a lot of very creative people to work um, and by funding them, not necessarily their output, not, fund, not, not paying them per, you know, per piece. And so this is, uh, this is a way where, where, where great things happen. We feel like it's been great for 84 years at Fortune Magazine. I think it's, 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 it's a model that we have to work on. And I, and I don't have much more time, in fact, I don't have any time, but uh, I'm happy to talk to people about ways in which we might fund people, not projects, later on. Imagine if we could take away all, I, again, keep the great basic science, but, but change the way we're sharing and integrating and paying for that so that we can take away the stuff that doesn't work. So we need to change that culture from within. And who does that? Well, it's largely up to us. It's the people in this room, the investor advocates, the industry advocates, the donor advocates, and the patient advocates and, the family, and their family members. That's that word, advocate, is so important. And it's amazing how much power you have. These are not insurmountable problems. We can make that change happen, and, um, and it's not just about raising more money and more research, as important as those, uh, those are, but we really have to change the way we spend that money and do the research. And hopefully we do that, and we can, wonderful life-saving achievements, uh, we can bring them even more to more people. So thank you. And thank you, fellow advocates, and uh, appreciate your time.